Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, uh, good morning everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure today to have Andy Curtis, um, who's visiting us from University of Waterloo, and he's going to tell us about a bunch of exciting stuff he's done at Waterloo and with some HP uh, collaborators around managing and operating data center networks. All right, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to show you how to reduce the cost of operating a data center network by up to an order of magnitude. Now, because the data center network is 10 to 15 percent of the total cost of operating a data center, this can result in pretty significant cost savings. And the data center has been described as the new computer, and the network plays a crucial role in this new computer. It interconnects the compute nodes, so we need a high-performing network. And in particular, network performance is critical for doing things like dynamically allocating servers to services. So this allows you to dynamically grow and shrink the pool of servers assigned to a service so you can maximize your server utilization. If you don't have enough bandwidth in the network, then you need to statically assign enough servers to your service to handle its peak load. And this results in very underutilized servers, which then cost more because you have to buy more servers. Another thing that a high-performing network is useful for is doing things like quickly migrating virtual machines. And this is also useful for service level uh, load balancing. And if the network doesn't have enough bandwidth, it can be a serious bottleneck in the performance of big data analytic frameworks. Uh, for example, in the shuffle phase of a MapReduce job, up to terabytes of data are transferred across the network. Now, when designing any sort of network, we need to take into account the constraints and and goals of the target environment. So the data center has a few new things to it. The first of all is its huge scale. The network needs to be able to interconnect hundreds of thousands of servers and with very high bandwidth, as I just mentioned. An additional lesser, uh, lesser considered requirement of the data center is that the network needs to handle the addition of servers to the data center. So this is an aerial view of Microsoft's data center in Dublin. And these, these white units on the roof are modular data center units. And they probably each contain uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 servers. You can see that the roof is about a third of the way built out. And so as we build it out, there's going to be significantly more servers added to this data center. The computers and the little boxes on the roof? So they're in, they're, they're in modular. The oh, that's a good question. So there's also a traditional raised floor data center within. Okay. But so this is sort of a. Uh, you know, diff uh, I guess they're trying out this different uh, architecture. Um, right, so if we're designing our network to handle this sort of growth, we need to, the network needs to be able to have incremental expandability. And if we don't account for the fact that our data center will grow and change over time, then our network could end up being a mess after several years. So what we need is a flexible data center network. <laughs> no, I'm not sure where this is from. I don't think this is a Microsoft data center. All right, so if we consider the traditional data center network topologies such as the CLOS, Flattened Butterfly, HyperX, Bucube, and so on, these topologies are all highly regular structures. So they're incompatible with each other, and they're incompatible with legacy data centers. Um, and let me just illustrate this with a simple example. So this is the, the standard uh, fat tree. So here each switch in the network has four ports and then these yellow rectangles represent racks of servers. So let's suppose things are going well so over time we need to add a couple more racks of servers to this data center. The question here becomes well how do we rewire this network to support these additional servers? If we want to maintain the fat tree topology, we have to replace every single switch in this network. That's not cost effective, and it could result in a significant downtime, which is unacceptable in the data center environment. So we need flexible data center networks. Additionally, data center networks are hard to manage. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think the main problem with this is because it was full. I mean, if you, if you have right. support, it's possible to build out 
a network that has spare, spare ports in it, so you can still add more tours and aggregation layers without actually replacing the core. Right, so that, that's certainly true that the, I mean, I chose this example to be very bad, right? This is the worst case. Uh, however, even if we did sort of plan ahead for the growth, we're spending a lot of money up front that we don't necessarily need to, and Ethernet speeds are increasing faster than Moore's Law, so we can sort of ride the cost curve down if we can delay deploying additional capacity until we need it. Okay, so besides being inflexible, data center networks are hard, hard to manage. This is primarily because of their huge scale. They can consist of up to tens of thousands of network elements. And additionally, they have a multiplicity of end-to-end -end paths. So this is useful for providing high bisection bandwidth and high availability. However, it makes uh, traffic management quite challenging because traditional networking protocols were not built to handle this multiplicity of end-to-end -end paths. Okay, so just let me summarize the challenges briefly. I've identified these two challenges. First is designing a new upgraded or expanded data center network is a hard problem. And the second is then managing this network is also challenging. And that's mostly because these networks are very different than enterprise networks. So to resolve these challenges, I have made the following contributions in my dissertation. First, I developed theory to understand heterogeneous high-performance networks. By heterogeneous, I mean that the network can support switches with different numbers of ports and different link rates. Second, I have developed two optimization frameworks uh, to design these heterogeneous type of data center networks. The first is I, the framework designs heterogeneous class networks, uh, and I'll get into exactly what those are in a minute. And the second designs completely unstructured data center networks. So these are arbitrary mesh networks, and I'll get into why we want those. And then the third contribution I, I propose, or I, I made, is uh, scalable flow-based networking in the data center. So this allows you to manage the individual flows in your network using software running on a commodity PC. And the application we're going to use with this is to do traffic management in the data center. All right, so to describe my first two contributions to you, I'm going to describe these two uh, optimization frameworks that I developed. The first I call leg up. And as I mentioned, this, developed, this designs heterogeneous class networks. The second I call rewire. And this designs unstructured data center networks. So both of these are optimization frameworks for data center network design. And as input, they take in a budget, which is the maximum amount of money you want to spend on the network. If you have an existing topology, they can take that in so they can perform an upgrade or an expansion of that. Um, additionally, they take in the list of, of switches, so this needs to have the specifications and prices of switches available on the market. If you include modular switches, you need to include also the details of line cards. And then optionally, they can take in a data center model. And this is a physical model of your data center, so you can describe the rack by rack configuration of your data center. And they, these frameworks will take this into account to do things like estimate the cost of links. So like a link that attaches to two adjacent racks should be cheaper than a link that crosses the length of the data center. So my frameworks take this input and they perform an optimization algorithm to find some output topology. Now when we started thinking about this problem, we started with this hypothesis. And that is that by allowing switch heterogeneity, we'd be able to reduce costs. And the reason we made this hypothesis is because of the regularity and the, the rigidity of existing constructions don't allow any heterogeneity in your switches. So by allowing this, we, we believe we can come up with more flexible networks that we can then expand and upgrade more cost effectively. So when deciding the output topology for an optimization framework, for the first pass, we decided to constrain this output to a sort of a class-like network. And I call this the heterogeneous class network. And again, by heterogeneity, I mean that we can use switches with different numbers of ports. So that is, their radices can be different. And we can have different link rates. So when you say like heterogeneous switches would reduce costs, are you taking into account in any way like the, the additional or the higher cost of managing the heterogeneous set of switches? Right. So I am not taking that into account. I'm taking into account the additional cost to build it but not to manage it. Yeah. So when you 
have a DCN which has a generous device. Uh, have you considered like if you buy a lot of device of the same type, you can buy at much lower cost than buying many different kind of devices? Right. Especially when you need to customize each device based on your own needs. It's it's very difficult to ask multiple vendors to customize based on mm -hmm. their needs. Right, so I, I have considered that. I don't explicitly include it in my in my model right now. However, you could pretty easily extend the framework to include that where you have sort of buy at bulk uh, discounts. But, right, but I don't consider it for now. Okay, so when I'm describing this, I'm going to go into describe the theory of heterogeneous class networks now, and then I'll show you how to actually build these things with an algorithm. So while I'm describing this, I want you to assume that we can route on these networks and that we can do load balancing perfectly across them. And then later on, I'll show you how to get rid of these two assumptions. All right, so to review the class network, it looks like this. And this is what I call a physical realization of the class network because it represents the physical interconnection between switches. But it turns out there's a more compact way we can represent this. And that's by collapsing each of these bipartite, these complete bipartite subgraphs into a single edge. So we have something that looks like this. And I call this the logical topology. So here, each logical edge represents this complete bipartite subgraph. And the, the number on it indicates the capacity of the underlying physical network. So it turns out for a class network, the logical topology is always a tree. But I started thinking about this and I was thought, well, why can't we separate this and deploy the capacity across a forest of trees? And so the problem becomes now, if we can split the capacity like this, the problem of designing a heterogeneous class network is we're given a set of top of rack switches and each rack has a demand which this is the uplink rate that it would like. So here you can think of this rack wants four gigabits of uplink, and over there they want 64 gigabits of uplink. And this rack of servers should be able to get this uplink rate regardless of the traffic matrix. So this is also called the hose model. Now, it turns out that for this, this set of top of rack switches, there's three optimal logical topologies. And by optimal, I mean that these topologies use the minimum amount of link capacity uh, necessary, sufficient and necessary to serve these uh, demands here. All right, so optimality, at least in the theory, is only on link capacity. Now, there's, so for any given set of top of rack switches, there can be a bunch of different logical topologies. So our first result is how to construct all optimal logical topologies given a set of top of rack switches. Then, once we have these logical topologies, we need to know how to actually translate them back to a physical network. And so that's our second result, is that given a logical topology, we find all physical realizations of it. So for this logical topology, here's one physical realization of it. Okay, Question? Go back to the, uh, I guess two slides back now. So I'm trying to understand that there's, the thing on the right is very um, this. irregular, you might say, but you're sending um, like, you know, the, the guy that wants 64 is sending 8 in one direction and 56 in the other. Is, is this showing that X1 and X2 are different types of switches, or, or what, what optimization led to that? So X1 and X2 are just these logical nodes that represent a physical set of switches. So there can be different ways to represent these with physical switches. Um, the, the, I, the intuition here is that these nodes need to send 64 uh, units of traffic and be able to send that anywhere in the network. So, but because these nodes only need four uh, units of traffic, then we don't necessarily have to send all 64 of that connecting to these guys. If we, if we get four connecting to those guys, then that's enough to, to serve all the different traffic matrices possible. So the sum of uplink bandwidth is the same in all these logical constructions. It's just we sort of distributed it differently. Yeah. So do you assume the traffic demand is there? No, I'm not assuming the traffic demand is there. I'm assuming this, this host model, which is a, actually a polyhedron of traffic matrices. So it's an infinite set of traffic matrices, and it's all the traffic matrices that are allowed under this, these 
rates here. So as long as this rack never sends nor receives more than its rate, then that's a valid traffic matrix. So that's the opposite of the traffic matrix. Yeah, so we're sort of optimizing for the worst case traffic matrix possible. Yeah. Okay, so again, this is the physical realization of this, and here's physical realizations of the other topologies. So you can see we just essentially spread the, the capacity out across a certain number of physical switches. And then the link rates are determined by the, the uh, logical edges. Okay, so to summarize, the first result is how to construct all logical topologies. The second is then how to translate a logical topology into all its different physical realizations. So together, this gives us a theorem that characterizes these heterogeneous class networks. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first optimal topology construction that allows uh, heterogeneous switches. Now this theory is nice, it's very elegant. However, it doesn't tell us how to actually build these networks in practice because the metric for a good topology under the theory is that it uses the minimal amount of link capacity. But in practice, we need to take into other accounts, other things into account, such as the actual cost of the devices. So in practice, a data center network should maximize performance while minimizing costs, should also be realizable in the target data center. So this means that, for instance, if we have, in order to realize the topology, if we have so many switches that it's going to draw too much power, that doesn't do us any good if we can't actually build that. And then finally, if we're talking about upgrading or expanding a data center network, you know, our, our algorithm should be able to incorporate the existing network uh, equipment in, into the network if it makes sense to do so. Yeah, Ritul? Let's give a little bit of insight into the proof of the theorem. I'm wondering, like, why, why are you not running into computational hardness associated with bin packing or such problems? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. Why, why don't we have to worry about bin packing here? And that's, again, because I'm assuming that load balancing is perfect so we can split flows. So if you have splittable flows, you don't run into the, this uh, bin packing problem. Uh, you can just solve it using linear programming. And actually, we can solve it analytically. That's the way we've solved it. I see. So the flows should be able to, you can arbitrarily split flows. Exactly. Any ratios. Exactly. OK. So by, yeah, by arbitrarily, that's why I'm assuming this for the theories, because it makes the theory much easier. Yeah. Do you know any switch that can uh, proportionally divide load across multiple I don't know any switch that can do that, which is why we wouldn't do that in practice. And that's why uh, at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about traffic engineering, like doing flow scheduling so that we can maximize throughput even with this type of topology. Yeah. I'm also wondering if you're taking failures into account. So a lot of actual data center networks are built so that the failure of any one switch has a minimal impact on the network as a whole. But it seems like if you have X1 and X2, and X2 is handling 90% of the traffic, and X1 is only handling 10, and a failure of X2 would cause a disproportionate disruption. Right. So as far as failures, the way we handle that is that in the optimization algorithm, so I've, I, there's different ways you can formulate it, but I've, I've formulated as a constraint in the opti optimization problem that says each rack must have this, many, this much capacity uh, if there's a certain number of link cuts. Why don't you also have flexibility as one of the goals? Uh, maybe the, that rack to, in the week will need eight gigabits. Right. So in um, when I originally did leg up, I did in fact have I had the optimization criteria was to maximize bisection bandwidth plus flexibility, where we had some notion of flexibility, but it turns out I think it's really hard to capture flexibility in a nice simple metric. So that's why for my second step in rewire, I, I abandoned that because I think it, I couldn't find a good formulation of that. And I'd be happy to know if you have a good one. Yeah. So your topology looks like more like an asymmetric topology. Uh, if you make any change to your topology, can you still maintain the optimality of the topology? Or you have to rerun optimization, rewiring or not to achieve this? Right, so the changes, I mean, so I want to emphasize that this is just the theory. And, you know, so when we actually design these with the, the optimization algorithm, it does try, if you need to make changes, it tries to minimize the cost of making those changes. 
Like it tries to, we take into account the cost of rewiring things and so on. So as a human, you know, ideally my goal is to not have to think about that and let the algorithm think about that for you. But I think your advantage, the key advantage of your approach is flexibility mm -hmm. of making changes rather than how you can accommodate heterogeneous devices and uh, just come up with one topology that is mm -hmm. uh, Can you show something that you can flexible, flexibly make changes to the topology? Yeah, so you can flexibly, I mean, right, so these are more flexible in the sense that you have, with the clause, you have one configuration, right? So for these, I've actually just shown one way of physically, I mean, so for this, just these, these set of topper racks, we had three different logical topologies, and actually there's just, I only showed you these three physical realizations, but there's a bunch of different ways. So because of this additional flexibility, like say you need to make one change here, you have a lot of topology options that are still like optimal under my link capacity constraint. Whereas with a class, you just have one arrangement. So that's why it's so much more flexible. It's because there's this multiplicity of uh, topologies that are also optimal. And, and I want to emphasize that the algorithm doesn't require the optimality of the topology. This is just what it aims to do. Do you have any example to show, okay, given this traffic matrix, uh, you can class has this topology to, and both class and uh, the heterogeneous class can come up with this topology to accommodate this traffic demand, of a known traffic demand. And in the future, if this traffic demand change, is it cheaper to accommodate the new traffic demand in your framework than in uh, uh, original so I guess I don't have a specific example for you right off the top of my head. Uh, I don't think it would be hard to find one though. And I'll show you our experiments of using this to upgrade the University of Waterloo's data center. And we do actually find significantly uh, lower cost solutions. Okay, so like I said, that's a nice theory, but we now need an optimization algorithm to actually design these sort of networks. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over the leg up algorithm. So what it does is it performs a branch and bound search of the solution space. Um, normally with branch and bound, you can guarantee the optimality. However, we can't quite guarantee that because we do have to use some heuristics to map switches to racks. And we do this to minimize the length of cabling used. Um, and then, you know, this algorithm does scale reasonably well. In the worst case, it is exponential in the number of top of racks and the number of switch types. Uh, however, you know, in my experiments, I didn't find this, this behavior. Uh, for a 760 server data center, it uh, found it took about five to 10 minutes to run the algorithm. And this is for the hardest input I could find. If you give it an easy input, for instance, if the top rack switches are homogenous, it only takes a couple seconds to run. Uh, for a data center 10 times that large, it takes a couple days. But, I, but my implementation only runs on a single core, and it would be easy to parallelize or distribute this. Yeah. Why don't you just add a cost factor or a constraint for cable length to the optimization picture? Yeah, so I, I did, uh, so you're seeing in, in the formulation of the problem, uh, the cost, right? So I didn't do that just to avoid the additional complexity of that. However, I think like given these pretty good run times, I think it would probably be possible to do that, but I haven't explored it. Okay, so to summarize leg up, um, I developed this theory of heterogeneous class networks, implemented the leg up design algorithm, and then I evaluated it by applying it to our data center. And I'll show you more results later after I describe rewire. But for now, I'll spoil some results and say that for our data center, it cuts the cost of an upgrade in half versus a fat tree. So let me move on to rewire. And now rewire, we're going to do away with the, the structure of the network entirely and design entirely unstructured networks. And I'm really motivated by this question of, well, all right, so it seemed like the structure was hurting us in a class network, and by allowing some amount of flexibility, we could do a lot better. So if we just use an arbitrary mesh, how much better could we actually do? The problem here is that now we have a really hard network design problem. The heterogeneous class networks were still somewhat constrained, so we could sort of iterate through all the different possibilities and evaluate them. But now we have a completely arbitrary mesh, so there's 
many, many, many different networks for any given set of top rack switches. So to solve this, I used a simulated annealing algorithm. And the goal of this algorithm is to maximize performance. And by performance, I mean bisection bandwidth minus the diameter of the network. So if you don't know what bisection bandwidth is right now, I'll, I'll explain exactly what that is in a minute. And the diameter is the worst case shortest path between any top of racks. And I'm using diameter here as sort of a proxy for latency. Because latency is actually very hard to estimate. You need to know queuing delays and so on. So that's why diameter is just a proxy for that. These are, these are different units, so what I do is I scale them to be between 0 and 1. So diameter, you can think of the best diameter in a network is uh, 1. It's one hop behind, between all the nodes. The worst is a path, so you can scale that to be between 0 and 1. And then, you, and then bisection bandwidth I normalize as well. So then you can weight each of these by however much you want. And it does take some playing with the weights to get what you want. Uh, but because you can, you can so tweak it. So Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so then rewire maximizes the performance subject to the same constraints as leg up, subject to the budget, your data center model if you give it one, but now we have no topology restrictions. And here the costs we take into account are the cost of any new cables that you may buy, the cost to install or move cables and then the cost of any new switches you may add to the data center. So Rewire performs a standard simulated annealing. So at each iteration, it computes the performance of a candidate solution. And then if that solution is accepted, it computes the next neighbor to consider and so on, and repeats this until it's converged. Now, we do have some heuristics for deciding the next neighbor to consider, but I don't have time to cover that because I want to talk about how to compute the performance of a network. And it turns out there's actually no known polynomial time algorithm to find the bisection bandwidth of an arbitrary network. So the bisection bandwidth is the minimum bandwidth across any cut in the network. And we can find the bandwidth of a single cut pretty easily. So let me denote the servers on one half of this cut by S, the others by S prime. Then the bandwidth of this cut is equal to the sum of link capacity crossing that cut divided by the minimum of the sum of server rates in S and the sum of server rates in S prime. So for this speci specific example, uh, we have four links crossing the cut. Let's just assume their unit capacity. And then we divide by the min of S has two racks of servers, just say there's 40 servers per rack, and S prime has six servers of 40, or sorry, six racks of 40 servers. Uh, so here the, the bandwidth of this single cut is 4 divided by 80. Then the bisection bandwidth is the minimum bandwidth over all cuts. So on a tree-like network, it's easy to compute this because we can simply enumerate over all of the cuts. There's only O of N of them, and we can compute that equation I showed on the previous slide, and we have a polynomial time algorithm. Yeah. I'm a little confused uh, about your definition of bisection bandwidth. Nor normally, you would just compute it as the, bis the bandwidth traversing a cut, but you're dividing by the number of servers, so it, it seems like it's actually more like fair share bandwidth per server or something. You're right. So the reason I'm dividing by um, the number of servers is because we can have these heterogeneous rates. And so we need to take, you know, if one, if uh, on one half, if here all these servers were super high capacity, they all had 10 gig links and these had one gig, then it would, it's not just fair to divide or not divide by anything. Right, so we need to normalize it by the amount of capacity we ex actually expect to cross that cut. And so the reason why we divide by the min is that, all right, so that let's just assume homogeneous rates for now. And here there's two racks of servers, here there's six. Well, these six racks can't push, uh, so there's six units of traffic. They can't push six units of traffic across here because these guys can only receive two units. So that's why we divide by the min. And these guys can likewise only push two out. I just call it something other than bisection bandwidth because that's already better yeah. something different. <laughs> I think I, I think I yeah. Probably should call it cut bandwidth or something. Since people have a notion of what that is, right? Okay, so this is easy to compute on a tree. However, on an arbitrary graph there can be exponentially many cuts. Therefore, it would take exponential time to compute this in the worst case. So if we stop to think about it, 
Uh, the traditional min or max flow min cut theorem allows us to find the min cut in a network by solving this flow problem. So we'd like to be able to do the same sort of thing here. But the problem is we don't have a single flow problem. We actually have a multi-commodity flow problem because each server can be the source and the sink of flows. And in general, the min cut max flow theorem does not hold for multi-commodity flow problems. However, we've shown that in our special case, there is a min cut max flow theorem. And what we've shown here is that our host traffic model, so throughput in the host traffic model is equivalent to bisection bandwidth. So therefore, if we can compute the max throughput in this traffic model, then we found the bisection bandwidth. And it turns out some guys at Bell Labs had done this a few years ago. So combining these two results, we get a polynomial time algorithm to compute the bisection bandwidth. And then we just run the simulated annealing procedure as normal, computing this at each iteration to find the performance of a candidate solution. So I'm going to move on to my evaluation. And here the question we really want to answer is, well, how much performance do we gain because of this additional heterogeneity in the network? So to evaluate this, I, I tested several different scenarios. Uh, first, I tested upgrading the Waterloo's data center network. Um, then I, I tried iteratively expanding our network. So this is I add a certain number of servers at each iteration and use the output from one as input into the next iteration. Uh, then I used these algorithms to design brand new or greenfield data center networks. And then also I asked them to design a, a new data center network and then iteratively expand it. So this is the cost model I used. Uh, this is the cost of switches, the cost of links. For switches, it's very hard to you know, get good estimates on street prices of switches. So these are the best I could find just by Googling around. Um, I wouldn't actually stand by these exact specific values. However, I think their relative differences uh, are meaningful. These are the prices we use for links. Uh, to simplify things, I categorized links as short, medium, or long, and then charge accordingly according to the length and according to the rate. And then I charge a different cost to actually install the, the link. And that's because we charge this amount if you're going to move a link. We charge that same amount so we don't recharge you for the link itself. OK, so to compare my algorithms against the state of the art, these are the approaches I used. So I compared against a generalized fat tree. This is using the most general definition of a fat tree possible. And here I don't explicitly construct the fat tree. Instead, I just bound the best case performance. So you're given a budget, and I bound the best case performing fat tree you can, you can build using that budget. Second, I test against a greedy algorithm. This algorithm just finds the link that improves the performance the most adds it, and then repeats until it's used up its entire budget, or all ports in the network are full. And then the third thing I tested against is a random graph. This is because a group at UIUC has proposed using random graphs as data center networks. And this is due to the fact that random graphs tend to have really nice properties. OK, so this is what our data center network looks like. Uh, we have 19 edge switches. Each of these edge switches connects to 40 servers. So we have a total of 760 servers. Our edge switches are heterogeneous already. And all our aggregation switches are the same model. They're all these HP 5406 switches. However, this is a modular switch. And they do have different line cards, so they're heterogeneous as well. Um, and this is our actual topology. So you can see between our top of racks and aggregation, we only have a single link. There's no redundancy there. Additionally, our data center handles air quite poorly. There's no isolation between the hot and cold aisles. Uh, so to model the fact, the fact that my algorithms can take thermal constraints into account, I simply allow you to add more equipment to, into the racks closest to the chiller. So here, this rack can take, uh, I can't remember the exact number, I think it's 20 kilowatts of, of equipment, whereas the racks on the other end can't take nearly as much because they don't get as much cold air from the chiller. Uh, I want to emphasize this is very much just a first pass approach. And, if your data center was severely thermally constrained, you'd want to do something more sophisticated than this. OK, so let me show the results of expanding the Waterloo data center now. So this is our original network. And here, I'm showing the normalized bisection bandwidth. And right below it, I'm showing the diameter. And then here, I'll show the number of servers we've added. So you can see our data center network right now has a normalized bisection bandwidth of just over 0.01. 
So this means that it's oversubscribed by a factor of almost 100. So in the first iteration, I added 160 servers and then asked each of these algorithms to find an upgrade given a fixed budget. All right, so all these algorithms have the same budget, and across iterations, the budget is kept the same. So you can see that the fat tree was not able to increase the bisection bandwidth of the network while the other approaches were. However, the fat tree is able to attach the new servers to the network without decreasing the bandwidth of the network. Um, you see here that the greedy approach and rewire perform the same. They both uh, significantly increase the bisection bandwidth and actually decrease the diameter by one. And leg up just increases the, the bisection bandwidth. Yeah? Um, for your work, uh, if they were going through an upgrade, probably the data center managers would just sort of look at it and intuit an upgrade plan just mm -hmm. manually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you compared against that. Uh, so I did ask them about an upgrade plan. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to compare against that. I didn't explicitly, like, measure what they would have done. Um, and they told me, you know, essentially, our network doesn't need this high of, high of performance. So, I mean, I, I get, you know, I admit it's sort of, I'm applying it to a network that doesn't need this kind of bandwidth. Like, for instance, we only have one link between our top of rack and irrigation switches. So, what they told me is that these, the, the things found by leg up, are probably not what they would have thought of, but that they seem like, okay, this is an interesting solution. We could probably implement this. Um, they had not considered like the, the networks found by rewire, the greedy approach, because these are arbitrary meshes, and they don't want to do that because it would make it harder for them to manage their network. Um, but you know, I'm trying to, to push the frontier of what's possible here, so that's why I think these are still interesting. Okay, so. As we keep iteratively expanding the network, adding more and more servers, uh, you can see that the performance gap between rewire and, and the other approaches grows. Um, so here, after we've added 480 servers, rewire's network has four times more bisection bandwidth than the fat tree. Um, it does slightly go down in the next iteration, and that's because we're adding more servers, so we're adding more demand to the network. However, it is able to decrease the diameter down to two. Um, and because we have this multi-objective function, it, due to my weighting, it preferred decreasing the diameters compared to in the increase in bisection bandwidth. Um, and you see that the greedy algorithm underperforms over time. So initially, it did extremely well. However, it wasn't able to increase the performance of the network past this point. And that's likely because it made a poor decision here and over time isn't able to, then it used you know, all the good ports, and over time it doesn't change where things are rewired, excuse me, where things are wired, so it locked itself into this sort of narrow solution. Okay, so then the next scenario is just asking these algorithms to build a brand new or Greenfield data center. So, one quick question mm -hmm. so how many runs are we looking at here? Like you said the greedy algorithm made a bad decision. Did you do that repeatedly, or did you just run one experiment? Oh, right. So I did do it repeatedly. I'm not showing error bars here. Uh, but in the, in, across all the uh, experiments, it seemed to do the same thing. Um, and that's, it is actually a, uh, a deterministic algorithm. So yeah, so there's no. So you, you didn't perturb the system to, you know, the error bars didn't represent the results of having perturbed the system to give greedy an opportunity to, to behave differently. Right, I mean, right. so that's because we're using this static input. We're using our existing data center, right? So we run a deterministic algorithm on it, and we get the same result every time. Right, sorry. So there's no, right, there's no error bars on this. Uh, so the, the error bars would be on rewire because it's a simulated annealing algorithm. Um, however, so for that, we ran it enough times that they're, like, um, I didn't actually put them on this chart, but they're, uh, you know, very small. I think what Jamie's criticism is that he's trying to understand is that it, it seems like you should do something. If greedy is subject to fall into to pits, then you may have shown us a, a, a case where greedy is trapped in a pit, but maybe it, it doesn't always behave that way. And so maybe it would be interesting to ask what would happen if I perturbed you know, the number of servers added a little bit either way or just didn't, it provided that. some source of entropy right. and input that would let you explore more of the space with greedy as, as well. Because rewire, as you point out, are, are already has some randomness in it that mm -hmm. causes it to explore more of the space. 
um, just, just to understand whether whether the greedy, because otherwise the, the greedy, the, the comparison to greedy is sort of arbitrary. Right. Okay. I mean, that's a fair criticism that I did not, yeah, I didn't necessarily test enough scenarios with greedy. In the paper, there's more cases where we tested, um, and we we sent, we seem to find the same things that greedy initially does well, and then over time doesn't do very well. Okay, so for the next the next scenario is designing a brand new data center. So for this, we asked these algorithms to connect a network with uh, 1,920 servers. So for this, I'm assuming that each top of rack switch has 48 gigabit ports, and 24 of these ports connect down to servers, and 24 of them are open and are free to uh, build the switching fabric on top of using these open ports. Um, so here, again, I'm showing the same type of thing. We have bisection bandwidth on the vertical axis, the diameter here, and then the different approaches. So this is the, for a budget of using a quite small budget of $125 per rack, Rewire is the only algorithm that's able to build a connected network. And um, so I want to emphasize this, this budget does not include the cost of the top of rack switch. This is only for cabling, aggregation, and core switches. Um, so the reason Rewire is able to build a connected network here but no one else is, is that the fat tree and leg up have to spend money to buy aggregation and core switches. So their networks inherently at this low a budget cost more. Um, the random network has some randomness in it so it's not able to complete to build a connected network. So that's why Rewire is the only thing that has connected topology here. As we increase the budget, um, you can see that Rewire starts to significantly outperform the other approaches for all budgets except for $1,000 per rack, where the random network actually has more bisection bandwidth. And this is, again, this is the expected bisection bandwidth uh, for the random network. So I'm not actually explicitly building these random networks. I'm using a, a bound that's proven by some theoreticians on the amount of bisection bandwidth that have. Um, so you see that even leg up significantly outperforms the uh, fat tree designing brand new networks. So here, its network has twice as much bisection bandwidth with $1,000 per rack budget. Um, Rewire really outperforms the fat tree. So with a $500 per rack budget, it has 68 times more bisection bandwidth. When we increase the, the budget to $1,000 per rack, it has six times more bisection bandwidth. And in this case, where the random network actually beats Rewire in terms of bisection bandwidth, again, this is because I use this multi-objective function. So Rewire preferred decreasing the diameter by one rather than increasing the bisection bandwidth. So in other words, Rewire could have found the random solution. Yes. Yeah. It just didn't want to. It just, <laughs> it just didn't want to. you said the objective function differently. Right. And I mean, uh, also you could seed Rewire with a random network and then ask it to improve on that. And it, it does, it can improve on that. I've ran some experiments. Um, the performance gap though does seem to grow or shrink as you use uh, higher switch radices. Because the higher the radix of the switch, the better the random network does. But did, did you tell Rewire to try to optimize the thing that you're showing on the y-axis here, the bisection bandwidth? It's, it's, trying to, it's trying to optimize bisection bandwidth minus diameter. Minus you're being a little unfair to your own algorithm here because you're showing its performance on a metric that you didn't tell it to optimize for. Exactly. I mean, so I'm trying to show both of those, but it's hard to visualize them. So, you know, that's why. So here, yes, it does have a lower diameter. Yeah. Okay. Now, people have brought this up already. So the problem if, with moving towards these heterogeneous networks is management. In particular, there's a few things that are hard on, on an arbitrary network. So routing is difficult on an unstructured network. Um, if, you're, if we're talking about a heterogeneous class network, then we could make minor modifications to, to architectures such as Portland and VL2 and be able to route on a heterogeneous class network. And this is because fundamentally these networks are still tree-like, so you just go up to the least common ancestor and back down. Uh, however, on an unstructured network, it's quite a bit harder. There is one one architecture that allows you to uh, to route on unstructured networks, this is called Spain. It's by a group at HP Labs. And the way it essentially works is it partitions the network into a bunch of VLANs. 
and then does source routing across these VLANs. Uh, for load balancing, one solution is we could, do, we could schedule flows, and I have two solutions for that that I'll talk about next. Um, and then the other solution, again, is Spain does have load balancing built in, where we do this source routing and the source also do load balancing. Um, and then another option is to use multipath TCP, which has been shown that it's able to extract the full bisection bandwidth from random networks, so we'd expect it to be able to get extract the full bisection bandwidth from our unstructured networks as well. Now, it is unclear how much it would actually cost to build and over the long term manage these arbitrary networks. Um, however, I do believe that the performance per dollar in building the network compensates for this. All right, so I'm going to move on to my third contribution now, which is a framework to perform scalable flow-based networking in the data center. And I'm going to apply this to managing flows. And the reason we want to do this sort of flow scheduling is, for one, maximizing throughput on networks, like, like I just showed, these unstructured networks. But additionally, even on highly regular topologies like a fat tree, we can have this situation where flows collide on a bottleneck link. And if we just moved one of these flows over a bit, then we could actually double the throughput of both of these flows. And it's been shown by a group at UC San Diego that if you perform flow scheduling in the data center for at least some workloads, you can get up to 113% more aggregate throughput. Uh, however, their approach it depends on open flow. And open flow is not scalable, which I'll get into for a few in a minute. And the reason it's not, and so therefore their approach is not scalable as well. So I have two traffic management frameworks to solve this problem. The first we call Mahout, and Mahout uses end host to classify ele uh, elephant flows, which elephant flows to us are long lived, high throughput flows. So once the end host classifies the elephant flows, it's set up at a controller, and the controller dynamically schedules just the elephant flows to increase the throughput. And then our second solution is called DevoFlow. I worked on this joint with a bunch of people at HP Labs. And our goal here is to actually provide scalable software-defined networking in the data center. So software-defined networking allows us to write code that runs on a commodity server and manages the individual flows in our network. So this enables a type of programmable network because we can then just write the software to manage the flows. And this is currently implemented by the OpenFlow framework, which has been deployed at many institutions across the world. You can buy OpenFlow switches from several vendors like NEC and HP. And I think that OpenFlow is great. I think it's a great concept, but its original design imposes excessive overheads. Now to see why this is, let me explain to you how OpenFlow works. So this is what a traditional switch looks like, where we have the data plane and the control plane in the same box. So the data plane just forwards packets. And the control plane exchanges reachability information and then builds routing tables based on that. However, OpenFlow separates these two. So it looks something like this, where we have a logically centralized control plane at a central controller. And then OpenFlow switches are very dumb switches that just forward packets. So anytime a packet arrives at this OpenFlow switch that it doesn't have a forwarding table entry for, it has to forward it to the central controller. The controller decides how to route that flow, and then it inserts forwarding table entries and all the switches along the path, that flow. So the reason we want uh, OpenFlow in the data center is because it enables some pretty innovative network management solutions. Um, here's a partial list. So a few of the things we can do with OpenFlow are things like consistently enforce a security policy across our network. Um, it can be used to implement uh, data center network architectures such as VL2 in Portland. It can be used to build commodity, or excuse me, load balancers from commodity switches. And relevant to me, it can be used to do flow scheduling to maximize throughput, or it can also schedule flows to build energy proportional networks. So the, this works by scheduling the flows on the minimum number of links needed and turning off all the unnecessary equipment. So this is great that OpenFlow can do all these things, but unfortunately, it's not perfect. And the reason why it's not perfect is because it has these scaling problems. So, so implementing any of these 
solutions in a you know, mid-sized data center will be quite challenging. So our contributions with this work are first we characterize the overheads of implementing OpenFlow in hardware and in particular we found that the overheads of OpenFlow then there's obviously a bottleneck at the central controller since all flow setups need to go through the central controller that's you know creates an obvious bottleneck but we found that that's not the real bottleneck the real problem is at the switches themselves and we found that OpenFlow is very hard to implement in a high performance way in the switching hardware so to alleviate this, we propose DevoFlow, which is our framework for cost-effective scalable flow management. And then we evaluate DevoFlow by, by using it to perform data center flow scheduling. So I don't have enough time today to, to go over the overheads of OpenFlow. So I'm just going to skip to this and then go into our evaluation. Yeah. So I wasn't sure I understood. <clears throat> so you said I would have expected the problem to be that your every single flow setup data center wide or network wide has to go through a single centralized point. Mm -hmm. But you said it wasn't that. It was that there, it's hard to put open flow into individual switches, but I'm not sure which, which part of, I'm just not sure I understand the statement because it seems like open flow is running in a centralized place, not in individual switches. So open flow also has to run in switches. So let me go switch to my backup slides here. So, you know, I didn't really show the full picture of how this, this architecture looks like. So we have the ASIC here, which does this is you know hardware for specialized for forwarding packets, but also the switch has a CPU and that's used for management functions. And so anytime we do this flow setup through the ASIC, it has to go through the CPU. And the reason it goes through the CPU is because it needs to perform SSL and, T and then also it needs to perform TCP between the switch and the, the controller. So this CPU in, in Switches today is pretty wimpy. It can't handle this low of setting up all the flows. And um, you know, so we did simulations that looked at, okay, well obviously let's just put a bigger CPU in there and maybe that'll work. But we found this CPU would need two orders, would need to be two orders of magnitude faster than what's currently implemented in, open, uh, in HP's hardware at least. Uh, we're not sure about other manufacturers, but for HP it needs to be two, two orders of magnitude faster. Talking to centralized thing? Yeah. So what kind of hardware is the centralized thing running on? So the centralized thing is it's a server, you can be whatever you want it to be. So you're saying these eight the, these the switch control plane CPUs are so slow that even though there's two hundred times as many of them, they are bottleneck. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, unless you grow, you know, I mean for hundreds of thousands of servers, then the, the centralized controller could be a bottleneck, but you can still distribute it to alleviate that pressure. Overview of how you determine that was is it the CPU load is 100% or right? So it's CPU loads 100%. Yeah, and there's so we measure. Yeah, you can measure this CPU loads 100%. So we performed this experiment where we tried to just serially set up flows, um, and we found that the the 5406 switch could only set up 275 flows per second, and then the CPU was on 100%. Yeah. So is it setting up a new SSL connection every time? It's not, no, so it's, it's it, yeah, it sets that up just once. I mean, it's not that dumb to do it, to do it every time, but it's still, it's, uh, yeah, very high overhead at the control plane in the switch. I mean, so to, to show you, like, we can expect bursts of up to 10,000 flows at an edge switch in a data center. So, you know, this is 40 times more than the, the switch can currently handle. And, and it does create a lot of uh, latency in this flow setup. So we measured the amount of time it took to just set up this flow and it could take two milliseconds. Why do switch vendors sell hardware that's so severely handicapped? <laughs> I mean, so part of the problem is these are commodity switches. Like if you were to go out and buy a high-end router, um, you know, they could probably get rid of a lot of these problems. Uh, then the second problem is that these switches right now aren't designed for open flow. So they're designed to do you know, normal switching stuff, and then they're adding OpenFlow on top of it. And for the major vendors now, they're not going to let OpenFlow drive their switch development for at least five years or so. I mean, I do think it's a great opportunity for some startup to come in and build specialized OpenFlow switches. Is it over 35 or this is Just at an edge switch. So yeah, in the... 
the Wisconsin measurements, they showed that you can have bursts of up to 10,000 flows per second. Okay, so the way that DevoFlow works is we want to find this sweet spot between the fully distributed control and fully centralized control. So DevoFlow Devo stands for devolved open flow. And the idea is that we're going to devolve control over most flows back to the switches. So our, our design goals were this. We want to keep most flows in the data plane. And that's to avoid the latency and the overheads of setting them up at the central controller. Then we want to maintain just enough visibility for effective flow management. So we only want to ma you know, maintain visibility over the flows that matter to you, not all the flows. And then our third goal is to actually simplify the design and implementation of high performance switches. Because I said, you know, it's difficult to, to do this in OpenFlow right now. You need a fast switch CPU. If you really increase the speed of the CPU, you may have to re-architect the switch itself. So we, we want to do away with all that by keeping most flows in the data plane. So the way we do this is through a few different mechanisms. We propose some control mechanisms and some statistics gathering mechanisms. Now, one thing I didn't talk about is that collecting the statistics from flows is also has quite ho high overhead. This is because OpenFlow offers one way to gain visibility over your flows, and that is you can ask it for all the forwarding table counters and say, how many bytes did each flow transfer in the last, you know, since I last polled you? And um, by doing this, this is very high overhead because you have to get the statistics for every single flow at the switch. So the control mechanisms we propose, the first we call rule cloning. And the idea here is that the ASIC itself in the hardware should clone, be able to clone a wildcard rule. So OpenFlow has two different types of forwarding rules. It has wildcard rules, which can have wildcards, and exact match rules. So the rule cloning, the way it works is if a flow arrives and it matches, say, this rule, then it can duplicate that and add a specific entry for that flow into the exact match table. And the reason we want to do this is so then we can gain visibility over these flows. We can pull these statistics and just gain the visibility over the flows that we, we cloned. Uh, then the other things we propose are some local actions, so rapid rerouting, so you can specify fallback ports and so on if, um, if a port failure happens. And then also we propose some multipath extensions. So this allows you to select the output port for a, for a flow according to an arbitrary probability distribution. So if a flow arrives, you can select its output port according to some distribution such as this. And this allows you to do static load balancing on uh, mesh topologies. Then this. Are you proposing implementing that? <laughs> so, Implementing this is, is a little bit harder. Uh, all these things, so I want to emphasize we haven't implemented DevoFlow in hardware. So all these things we talked to H HP's ASIC designers, and they assured us that, okay, this should be relatively easy to do uh, in the hardware. So, right. So this, this, I'm not saying per, fl uh, per packet, I'm saying per flow. Well, that's, the, that's the trick, right? If you're not doing per packet, getting these even numbers or getting the desired statistics becomes really hard. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, who knows what's going to happen, right? If you do per packet, it's easier to get the distribution you want. If you start doing per flow, then you have to estimate flow sizes and things like that. Right. So I'm not, yeah, we're not taking that into account. But, uh, I mean, the theory says if there's lots of mice, then this will give you sort of optimal load balancing. If there's lots of elephant flows, then, yeah, you can run into these problems that you mentioned. Um, and I'll get into that. So we're going to actually do some flow scheduling to schedule the elephant flows explicitly. Okay, so the statistics gathering mechanisms that we propose are, first of all, you can just turn on sampling. Most commodity switches already have sampling. And w in our experiments, we found that this does give enough visibility over the flows. Um, another is triggers and reports. So you can set rules that if a forwarding table rule has uh, 40 to a certain number of bytes, then it'll set that flow up at the central controller. So this allows you to gain visibility over just elephant flows. And then there's additionally, we can add approximate counters, which allow you to track all the flows matching a wildcard rule. This one is much harder to implement in hardware, um, so I won't use it for my evaluation. But the, the idea here is that unlike open flow, we want to provide a visibility over a subset of flows instead of all the flows. All right, so I mentioned, yeah, we, we haven't implemented it, but we can reuse 
existing functional blocks in the ASICs for most mechanisms. So DevoFlow provides you the tools to scale your software-defined networking application. However, it still might be quite challenging to scale it. And each application will be, will be different. The idea is essentially that you need to define some sort of notion of a significant flow to your application. Um, in, in flow scheduling, which is what I'm going to show, it's easy to define the significant flows. They're just elephant flows. Uh, for other things like security, it may be more challenging. To, and, and, you know, so that's why for now I'm only going to show how to do uh, flow scheduling with DevoFlow. So the idea here is that new flows that arrive are handled entirely within the data plane by using these multi-path forwarding roles for new flows. And then the central controller uses sampling or triggers to detect elephant flows. And the elephant flows are dynamically scheduled by the central controller. And then the this, this scheduling is done using a bin packing algorithm. OK, so in our evaluation, we want to answer this question. So how much performance, or excuse me, how much can we lower the overheads of OpenFlow while still achieving the same performance as a fine-grained flow scheduler? So we found that if you perform this flow scheduling, you can increase the throughput 37% for shuffle workload on a class network, 55% uh, on a 2D hypercube. And these numbers really depend on the workload. So I also reverse engineered a workload uh, published by Microsoft Research. And I didn't see any sort of performance improvement using this workload. And a big reason for this is that I don't have the, there's no sort of bursts of traffic in this. It's sort of just flat. Because I reverse engineered this from the flow inter-arrival times and the flow, the distribution of flow sizes. Question? I understand the evaluation. You were, you were saying you wanted to reduce the overhead on the control plane while achieving the same performance, but then your results are increases in performance. Right, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get into the, I just want to show you these are, if you do flow scheduling, these are kind of the increased performance you can get with it versus, versus uh, ECMP, okay. using just static yeah. load balancing. Right. Versus random ECMP, essentially. Right. Okay. So this is fine-grained or Devo flow versus randomized with ECMP. Uh, and then here's the, here's the results on the overheads. So this, this, the vertical axis is showing us the number of packets per second to the central controller. Um, this is simulations uh, where I, we reverse, excuse me, where we simulated OpenFlow based on our measurements of our real switch. Uh, so you see if we use OpenFlow stats pulling based mechanism to collect statistics, then we have about 7,700 packets per second going to the controller. If we use DevoFlow based mechanisms, um, such as sampling or these thresholds to, to uh, gain visibility over the flows, then we can reduce the, the number of flows to the, excuse me, the number of packets to the controller by one to two orders of magnitude. And again, this is just because we're only gaining visibility over the elephant flows here. At least with the thresholds, this is only the elephant flows. And then sampling, we're collecting samples for every single packet, but it's still lower than collecting the statistics on every single flow. So there's no, there's no cost in performance. This is what I'm saying, for the same performance, this is the decrease in overheads. All right, so this is showing the number of flow table entries at the average edge switch. So here with OpenFlow, we have over 900 flow table entries. Uh, with DevoFlow, we can reduce that 75 to 150 times. And this is because most flows are routed using a one single multipath forwarding rule. And then we only need to add specific exact match entries for elephant flows. How are you evaluating that the performance was the same? Because this wasn't implemented, this was simulated, right? Right, so I simulated it. Um, so so I, I basically simulated a lot of different scenarios and found, so I sort of did like a binary search on the performance to get them the same. Right. So that answer? The performance is aggregate throughput. Okay. So here on this workload, we're getting the same aggregate throughput using the fine grain scheduler as DevoFlow, okay. and these are the overheads. Okay, so you're, you're assuming a traffic pattern of some kind. 
Right, and then you're simulating what dec what decisions were made as to which link gets which flow, yes. and then figuring out how much aggregate yes. throughput was, was there. Yes. Okay, so that's, and you're not simulating any like TCP effects on packet loss. No, we're doing fluid level simulations. Okay, because I mean, because TCP sometimes has cliff performance that just dr dropping twice as many packets might give you one tenth bandwidth. Right. Right, so yeah, we're not, yeah, they sort of flow level simulations. Yeah. Yeah. So is this demo flow similar to header in the sense that you only schedule for the big flows, except that header did that at the edge versus dev flow did this in, in the switch? So Hedera, they, they, this is essentially Hedera here because they're using open flow statistics polling mechanisms to gain visibility over the elephant flows. Okay, so this is what Hedera does, and then Diva Flow is using our more efficient statistics gathering mechanisms to only look at the flows that matter, the elephant flows. Okay, so to summarize Diva Flow, we first characterize the overheads of open flow, then we propose Diva Flow to give you the tools you need to reduce the uh, the reliance on the control plane of your software-defined networking application. And then we showed that at least for one application, which is flow scheduling, it can reduce overheads by one to two orders of magnitude. All right, so I want to just briefly summarize the, the cost savings that are possible with my, you know, because of my results here. And that, you know, the network is five to 15 percent of, and this is just network equipment, is five to 15 percent of the total cost of ownership of a data center. So leg up can basically cut the cost of your network in half. Rewire can cut it by as much as an order of magnitude. So then you can significantly save money on your total cost of ownership of your data center with these two approaches. And then server utilization is often low because of the network limitations. So if you can extract more by section bandwidth from your network, then you might need to be able to deploy fewer servers. Since the servers are the majority of the cost of your data center, you may be able to achieve some cost savings there as well. So to go over my future work, I want to do quite a few things. So first of all, I'd like to work on a, few, a bit more theory type results. Uh, and I think it's really interesting I did use expander graphs as a data center network. Um, so expander graphs, if you're not familiar, they're graphs that are essentially rapidly mixing. And in the, the rewire work we compared, we swipped, switched out our objective function and instead of saying, okay, maximize bisection bandwidth, we asked them to maximize the spectral gap of a graph, which is the notion of a good expander. And we found that these graphs actually perform extremely well. And so I'm really interested, I think there is a connection between the expansion properties of a graph and um, the bisection bandwidth, so I'm interested in exploring that further. There's quite a bit of systems work I wanna do. I think that, um, would be really cool to actually go out and build an architecture specifically designed for unstructured data center networks. Uh, like I said, HP has one, uh, but I don't think it's the last word on that. Um, I think there's a lot of problems still open on uh, managing you know, multiple data centers, so I'm interested in inter data center networks. Um, some other thing that I have an ongoing project on is deadline aware big data analytics, adding deadlines to these uh, real, uh, excuse me, to big data type queries. Um, another thing I'm interested in is green networking and systems. We have a submitted paper that's on reducing carbon emissions of internet scale services. And you know, so if you, if you think about my work so far, I've worked on the data center infrastructure part of things. And I sort of want to move up the stack. So I want to move up to work on cloud computing, big data analytics, but more on top of that, I want to work on applications on top of big data analytics, on top of all these things. So I want to work on things like how can we upgrade our cities? How can we apply these same sort of analytic and theoretical techniques to design transportation systems, to jointly design smart grids, transportation systems, um, to design and also city services like police and fire uh, services. Um, and then also one, one thing I'd like to apply these things to is building zero energy legacy buildings. So people have ways right now of, of building, you know, buildings that use no energy whatsoever. They're completely carbon neutral. I'd like to develop low cost ways to retrofit existing buildings to be the same way. And I think this is really a grand challenge because in the next 40 years, 
we can expect two to four billion people to move into cities. So our cities are going to grow tremendously. The number of cars on the road will double. If we don't have smart people thinking of ways to solve these problems, then we're going to have over-congested roads and too many people moving into crummy neighborhoods with bad infrastructure. Uh, one project I've already worked on this is looking at the return on investment for taxi companies transitioning to electric vehicles. And we do find that with today's gas and electricity prices, it's actually profitable for taxi companies right now to move to electric vehicles. Okay, so to conclude, I developed the theory of high performance heterogeneous interconnection networks. Um, I built two data center network design frameworks, leg up and rewire. My evaluation of these shows that they can significantly reduce the cost of data center networks. And then I proposed DevoFlow for cost effective scalable flow management. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yeah. So when you were uh, talking about the evaluation of rewire, you said something really interesting. Uh -huh. uh, you said that I, I, I was asking if you compared it against a manually designed network. And as part of the answer, you said, well, the guys yeah. looked at rewire solution and said, oh, we hadn't thought of doing it that way, but we'd never actually do it because that would be difficult to manage. So I'm wondering, are these physically realizable? Are they practical? So I think they are. And uh, all right, so I mean, our IT, our, <laughs> I mean, IT guys, you know, IT guys are resistant to change. And I mean, so the cabling would be a, a problem at smaller scale, like in a container. It would it would be you know doable. Um, and then you would probably have to have a different solution, or you could run rewire on the inter-container scale. Um, and then, I, I mean, I think really the hard problem right now is, well, how do you route on this big of an, you know, on this big of an arbitrary mesh? And that is going to take some work, yes. Uh, but you know, the purpose of my work of doing this is to see, well, what's possible if we get away from what we're doing right now and we think ahead, you know, how much better networks could we build? And that's really the question that motivated that work. Yeah. Uh, question about this deep flow thing. So it, uh, you talked about, you know, the security thing. So the open flow, when they first talked about this E thing, mm -hmm. they said, you know, per flow network admission control, there's something that the open flow can provide. It's a great thing. Uh, but, you know, when they talked about this, it was mostly in the like, enterprise network settings. So I assume that in the data center networking, maybe you know that kind of peripheral uh, network admission control is not that important. So maybe that kind of security features mm -hmm. not that necessary. So you know maybe you know it's just fine uh, to do some kind of you know like you know, control uh, plane pushing some blacklist to uh, these individual switches and so on, so that you can you know reduce this overhead. Thing. Right, so, yeah, I want to I emphasize that we weren't the first people to say, let's use OpenFlow in the data center. Other people have done that before us. And so we're sort of, we looked at all that work and we, we said, well, look, this is really cool work, but will it work? And that's, that's like the goal of the DevaFlow work was to give people ways to actually use OpenFlow in the data center. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily think that OpenFlow is the right solution for security in the data center. Um, and Why is that? Because, as you mentioned, you know, per flow security in the data center might not be doable. And so we may need other things. But one way you could use DevaFlow is on a per flow, not on a per flow, but on a categorical basis, apply some sort of uh, route, route your traffic through a set of middle boxes that apply these features. Um, and that could be doable with using these wildcard rules. Yeah. I have a question about the deeper flow evaluation. So you said, if I understood correctly, that the main bottleneck with open flow is the CPU on each switch for the flow setup. And that limits the number of flow setups you can perform. Um, but then the evaluation was looking at metrics like um, packets per second for statistics mm -hmm. and forwarding table sizes and things like that. Were you trying to use these as a proxy for 
flow setup? Or yeah. I, there was a missing link there that I didn't Right. Think. We were trying to use that as a proxy for flow setup. Like if, we, if we're setting only, you know, an order of magnitude fewer flows up through the controller, that means only an order of magnitude are being set up through the switch CPU as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again.